Yes, let's do it. All right, so we left Grant and his army essentially stalled out in front of Petersburg. Lee had occupied the city and set up some defensive works, and Grant had also set up defensive works, as they always do now. Both sides are thoroughly entrenched. Grant is looking for some type of bold stroke to break the stalemate. He realizes that he's not, well, he's not ignorant of the political situation as well. He realizes that if Lincoln loses, probably the the North loses, and that's the end of it. So he's got to come up with something, some kind of bold stroke, some kind of creative uh, attack that's going to actually work. So he finds out from... General Burnside, actually. General Burnside is one of his uh, Grant's subordinates. And General Burnside, here's some of his, well, it's brought to him, but some of his uh, units, one regiment in particular, had some coal miners. And the miners proposed that if they dig a shaft, or they proposed to dig a shaft from their position to the Confederate line and then put mines in it, or we would say just explosives today, to blow a big hole in the Confederate line. So Burnside, yeah, says, okay, that's good. Let's try it. And he asks Grant for permission, and Grant approves. So they begin work on this shaft. They dig a, a big mine shaft under the ground begin on, beginning on June 25th. Within four weeks, the miners had dug a shaft that was about 575 feet long. It went under the Confederate lines and ended in a 75-foot T. So very long, well-planned mine here in late July. The Federals put 320 kegs of powder at the end of the shaft, and they ran a fuse back to the Union lines. Yeah. Run for it. Something like at the beginning of Mission Impossible. (laughs) Anyway, uh, on July 30th, the fuse was lit, and then nothing. Nothing happened. (laughs) And two volunteers went down into the shaft, down to where the explosives were, to fix the fuse. These are really gutsy guys. you got (laughs) to hand it to them. I would not volunteer for that mission. What if it blows up? Um, But it didn't. And so they fixed the fuse. They get out of there. The fuse is lit again. And at 4.45 a.m., the power went up in a tremendous explosion. And one of the... uh, Observers like I don't I didn't get the name of who said this or wrote this, but they said a fort and several hundred yards of earthwork with men and cannon was literally hurled 100 feet up in the air. So you have this huge explosion. It works. It works terrifically, and it creates a crater, 100 a crater, 175 feet long, 60 feet wide, and 30 feet deep. So it's an enormous crater. It makes a quarter mile long gap in the Confederate line. So this looks like it's going to be just the thing that Grant has been wanting and needing to happen. Burnside had actually trained a fresh division of U.S. colored troops. That's what they called black soldiers at the time. So he was going to send black troops in and they were trained. They were ready to go. And their job was to go around the crater, not into the crater, but around the crater, seal the break, and that would eventually cut Lee's army in two. But at the last minute, Grant and Meade decided that the black troops should be held in reserve. Instead, they chose a white division to lead the attack. And nobody's really sure exactly why this decision was made. Some people think that maybe Grant didn't want to be accused of sending black troops in to be cannon fodder, to be sacrifice, so to speak, because he knew that whoever went in first was going to get hammered pretty bad and and really shot up. Others say just the opposite is true. It was racism because they thought white troops would do better. In any case, they go with the white division, and they were not trained. They were not ready to go. Three Union division commanders literally drew straws to decide which one would go into the gap. It's like, I don't want to go. Do you want to go? No. Do you want to go? No. So they drew straws. And the commander of the division who won, or I should say lost, got got the short straw. He was drunk all throughout. It's just incredible to think of this. And so, as you can imagine, this is not looking good. The white division rushed in, and they did the exact opposite of what they were supposed to do. Instead of going around the crater, thousands of men go into the crater. Incredibly stupid. Before long, the crater was packed with Union soldiers. 
And um, by 8 a.m., the Confederates had sealed the break and they poured fire into the crater and they slaughtered the soldiers inside. It was like, as the old saying, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. That was a hopeless position. By this time, the black soldiers had arrived and they ended up being essentially pushed into the crater themselves, just kind of forced in because of the crowd. They were cut down by the rebels and many were killed after they surrendered. By 1 o'clock p.m., the battle ended and more than 4,000 Federals became casualties, while only about 1,500 rebels uh, became casualties, killed, wounded, or, or missing. Probably not missing in this battle because everybody was packed in so tightly. But So again, another complete Union disaster, this Battle of the Crater. Hey everyone, I'd like to take a short break in this episode to tell you about a way that you can both help this show and get free food out of the deal. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh, a meal delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. I've heard about meal delivery services on podcasts before, but I really enjoyed HelloFresh when I tried it out. And when I mentioned this company to my sister, she said that what she likes about it compared to other companies is that you get really interesting recipes, but it's not so exotic that it's hard for your kids to get into. Well, yesterday I made chicken pineapple quesadillas and my kids definitely got into it. They told me that it looked like food at a restaurant and that's not a comment that I've ever received for anything I've made. So what HelloFresh does is it sends you a meal kit made of responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and trusted sources. So a box shows up on your door. The ingredients are kept cool in ice packs and cooling materials. It could be there for hours and it's cooler than your refrigerator. The recipes are outlined on step-by-step instructions. And what it lets you do is save a ton of time because the ingredients come pre-measured in labeled meal kits. So you know exactly what ingredients go with each recipe. It took me maybe 20 minutes of chopping time and all the other prep time to make it. And you don't have to go to a store. So that's what really saves a lot of time. So when you subscribe, you get meals delivered right to your door every week for less than $10 per serving and free shipping. So right now, HelloFresh is giving a special offer to History Unplugged listeners. You get $20 off your first three boxes. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Unplugged60, that's 6 the number, and it's like receiving six free meals or up to 50% off three boxes. Again, visiting HelloFresh with this promo code really helps out the show and you get free food out of the deal. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Unplugged60. That's HelloFresh.com slash Unplugged60. All right. Well, it looks like looks like a stalemate here where both sides have realized you don't just foolishly charge and get cut down. So how, how does this look? Well, uh, it's, this is the last great idea that they try. You know, it doesn't work at all. It should have worked really well, but it didn't. The two armies essentially just skirmish for a while, for several months, actually. But there are no major engagements. So it really does turn into just a almost a World War I-style stalemate, for a while at least. Grant repeatedly tried to cut Confederate rail lines, mostly without success. And the Confederates try to find supplies. They are running out of supplies, especially food. And sometimes they succeed. There was a, a cavalry commander named Wade Hampton, from South Carolina, and he went out and was actually able to rustle up a bunch of cows. This is called the beefsteak run. They had all the, so many cute names for these things. Now, Lee, I'm, I'm, we're gonna so we're gonna stop with Grant and Lee for a minute. They're just gonna sit there and face each other off and not really do a whole lot for quite a while. We're we're gonna be going into the winter, so I want to move over to the Shenandoah Valley and talk about what's gonna happen there, and you'll see why in a minute. Special. I mean, it's important, but I have another reason why I want to talk about this. Lee heard that General David Hunter, he had replaced Siegel as commander of the federal troops in the valley. Uh, Siegel, of course, had completely blown his mission. So David Hunter, David Hunter, incidentally, uh, is the general in glory that Matthew Broderick's character uh, who's General Robert Gould Shaw, they, they have a conflict with. You remember, you remember that general? Uh, he, he had he liked cigars, and they they portrayed him as living large and actually stealing things uh, and putting them in his personal collection. But anyway, Hunter is now out of South Carolina. He's in the valley, and he's moving south toward Lynchburg. And so, General Lee orders. By at this point, who is his best subordinate? 
Longstreet's still not back. My old friend, General Jubal Early. Your ancestor, your uh, yeah, so-called I, ancestor. I wish, yeah. Uh, no, or maybe I don't. I don't know. He was kind of a scoundrel, too. But, um, anyway, Jubal Early, I've, I've just been dying to get him into the narrative, and finally. <laughs> so Early takes 14,000 men to stop General Hunter in the valley. Lee had several goals for Early. This is what he tells Early. He says, first of all, save Lynchburg. Second, march down the valley, and down the valley means north. It's kind of confusing if you're looking at a map. Toward the Potomac River and clear it of Federals. In other words, sweep away all the Union troops out of the valley. Cross the Potomac and threaten Washington. So it's, you know, no problem, right? Sounds really easy. (laughs) It's a big job. Uh, And it, it says a lot about General Early that Lee trusted him to do this. I don't think he would have trusted anyone else by this point with this job. Of course, if Stonewall Jackson were alive, it would have been his job, but he isn't. Uh, let's talk a little bit about General Early. General Early, Jubal Early had been a West Pointer, of course, like most of the major generals. After he left the army, he became a lawyer. He went back into the army in the Mexican War, and he, he had actually voted against secession. He was a Virginian. He didn't want to secede from the Union, but once Virginia decided to throw in their lot with the Confederacy, he became one of the most staunch Confederates you could find. General Early was a bachelor. He didn't marry, or at least he hadn't married to this point, but he had many children. <laughs> he was a real a ladies' man, let's put it that way. Uh, kind of the JFK of Virginia at the time, but he was profane, he was sarcastic, and he had done very well. He had worked his way up as a, uh, a brigade commander and then a division commander. Now he's a corps commander. And he's one of only two generals that Lee actually gave a nickname nickname to. Lee's nickname for General Longstreet was my old war horse, but he called General Jubal Early my bad old man. (laughs) I just love that nickname, my bad old man, which is funny because Lee was actually older. But General Early, he just he was prematurely gray and, and had a lot of white whiskers and white hair. And he just looked a lot older than he was. And. Um, it, I think it's kind of funny because from a personality standpoint and a character standpoint, Lee and Early were exact opposites. You know, Lee was a polished Southern gentleman. He was polite. He was courteous and kind. And obviously he was devoted to his wife and Early was just the exact opposite, profane, sarcastic, just kind of grumpy and grouchy and didn't like a lot of people, but, but they worked well together. I guess opposites attract, right? <laughs> the Confederacy's collective, uh, creepy old uncle or dirty old man. Let's consider Jubal early. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So early marches up to the Valley. He pushes Hunter back. Hunter retreats all the way into West Virginia. So once again, whew, the union gets booted out of the Shenandoah Valley. How many times is this now? This is uh, at least half a dozen times, I guess. Um, okay, Early continues up the valley, and General Early takes his army across the Potomac into Maryland. So this is the third time that a Confederate force has marched into Maryland, crossed into Union territory. And he's threatening Washington. He's heading that way, and Washington starts to get a little bit scared. Because here comes this madman <laughs> with 14,000 guys coming to coming for us. So... Uh, The Union Army throws together a force really quickly under General Lew Wallace. General Lew Wallace is famous later for writing the book Ben-Hur, on which one of my favorite movies is based. But at this time, he's just a a Union commander. So Lew Wallace is put in charge of the defenses around Washington to stop General Early. They fight in the Battle of the Monocacy, which is July 9, 1864, near Frederick, Maryland. The battle was a Confederate victory, but... The Federals did slow General Early down, and they bought time for the defenders of Washington to prepare. And by July 11th, General Early's army was just outside the defenses of Washington. So can you imagine that? This is the first time, the only time in the entire war when a Confederate force is actually right there at the doors of Washington threatening the city itself. Lincoln, of course, is very nervous about this. He's not really happy about 14,000 rebels right outside of Washington. He asked Grant to bring the Army of the Potomac back to Washington. He wants him to bring the whole army back. Grant said, "Uh, you know what, boss, that's not really a good idea. Uh, 
what will that say? You know, if, if I'm not going to, that's not, Grant wasn't a runaway kind of person. So he does send a few troops, a few thousand to help out 